Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game faction focus for the faction Toha. This was a heavily requested topic after the recent 2024 Infinity All Factions tier list, with requests basically for breaking down Toha as a faction. Toha have something of a reputation for being mechanically very different, sometimes mysterious, sometimes hard to decipher if you're playing against them, and a little bit challenging to pick up if you're a new player. And so this video will address this. We'll talk about what makes Toha unique mechanically and tactically, and then we'll jump into Infinity Army and we'll talk about not necessarily every unit in the army, but we'll talk about some of the key profiles, the things that are most important for Toha in approximate order of importance in terms of at least how I play the faction. Importantly, this is not a hot takes video. I've played Toha considerably and for some time, so we'll be speaking from a position of experience, talking about my personal opinions, how I play and how I understand the faction. So with that said, let's start with what makes Toha unique? There are probably about five things that I would say are important to Toha in terms of what makes them unique and different and why they can feel so different to play with and against compared to other Infinity Factions. Most of these are actually equipment differences, and the most important of those is Eclipse. Now, when you talk about Toha, and we will talk about access to skills like transmutation, unique equipment and weapons, but what really makes Toha most unique is their considerable and easy access to Eclipse templates, so Eclipse smoke templates. They have that on two troopers, and unsurprisingly, those two troopers will be the first two that we cover when we go into Infinity Army. But in short, Toha should never be without total control of the visibility game. Because Eclipse smoke is the only smoke that isn't ignored by multispectral visors, you can always block line of sight. And in fact, with Toha Ferroware, you can block line of sight without needing line of sight to the target point yourself. This radically and fundamentally changes how Toha can play, and Toha should always be played with this visibility game in mind. Every other faction, to at least some extent, has to think about how their opponents might contest them moving across the field, and if they don't want to, Toha don't. So this has a large number of effects, and I'm not going to break down all of them, but I do want you to encourage, encourage you to think about that if you are playing either with or against Toha. Toha should be using Eclipse as one of their primary tools to give them total freedom of movement across the field. Now, generally, the two most common ways this will turn into a significant advantage, firstly is scenario. You nominally can't stop Toha from moving forward and contesting scenario, at least you can't stop them with hard AROs. You have to use other tools, or you have to force them to lay down so much smoke that it is impossible for them to progress in an order efficient manner. In a lot of scenarios, particularly end game scenarios, Toha should always, usually around the third turn, take stock of the situation and decide if they can win without firing a shot. Decide if it's possible for them to just throw a clip smoke grenades and get where they need to be to do what they need to do to win the mission. More broadly though, across the entire scope of a three round game, what Eclipse does for Toha is it lets them pick their fights. So if you are playing Toha, you should never start by thinking just about the targets in front of you. You should never start by thinking, oh, my opponent has a core link team with a missile launcher standing up, I must engage it in order to proceed, because you do not have to engage it to, to proceed. Instead, as Toha, what you should typically do is start the turn by thinking about what is the most horrific possible firefight from the most horrific possible angle that you can impose on your opponent, and then see if you can get there. Because, frankly, there is a very good chance that you can, and you may even be able to get there efficiently if you build your army correctly. This means that as Toha, you should never be fighting fair. You should always be looking to leverage the fact that you can have at least theoretically uncontested movement across the field to leverage, like to, to get into firefights that your opponent just does not want you to be able to get into. No other faction has quite the same level of flexibility except perhaps Steel Phalanx, who can approach what Toha can do by linking Eclipse grenades. That's what Toha do, but Toha have other means of laying Eclipse as well, which let them support pass even Steel Phalanx in terms of visibility control. Ultimately, if you are a new Toha player, this is something that you will just have to learn how to use, but my basic advice is start each turn by thinking about what the worst possible thing that could happen to your opponent is, and work backwards from there, and see if there's a path you can lay with smoke to get there. The next thing that makes Toha unique is a combination basically of just the equipment they have that is unique. So we have a number of rules here that collectively are 
stuff that Toha has that either other factions don't have in great quantities or which they don't have at all. So this is a broad category, but a common example is the transmutation skill, which previously, and you may hear me refer to as symbio armor. Transmutation is a skill where when a trooper loses a wound, its profile changes, but typically transmutation troopers are at least two wound troopers. So for example, a Sukwell commando or a digger, just to take another example, is a trooper that starts off at full power and then it enters a transmuted state after it takes a wound, where it has much weaker statistics. Now, ostensibly, this is worse than just staying at full power as you are wounded, but the thing about transmutation is it typically makes a trooper much, much cheaper. So a Sukwail Commando, for example, is a light infantry that has two wounds, and it loses a variety of abilities as it takes damage, but it is much, much cheaper than if it were, for example, a heavy infantry with all of the same attributes, and it's light infantry, so it isn't hackable. In practice, this makes Toha much harder to actually put out of the game than other factions, especially combined with other pieces of equipment we'll talk about soon. But the way to think about it as a Toha player is, it's not that your troopers are good to the last drop, right? A Sukhoil Commando, this is going to be a classic and recurring example, it loses a lot of power when it takes a wound. You shouldn't think about that as, I get to keep fighting with an inferior version of my trooper. You think about it as, a Sukhoil Commando is effectively a one wound trooper that leaves behind an order and a body and an effective, like a, a, a unit in a combat group slot and that joins fire teams, right? It leaves behind an inferior trooper that you probably won't use, but which you still have in your army. The, the way to think about Symbio Armor, or the way that I at least typically think about Symbio Armor, is you get one really good, you get your one good use, your, your good single wound, and then you just get a trooper that generates an order, and which might be able to do some other things. So you keep your order pools alive as Toha, as your, like, your ARO pieces take their one wound, and then they go prone, and they hide, and it has taken your opponent as much effort to put that one wound down as it would take to put down, for example, a fusilier missile launcher in a link team, but you get to keep that model alive and generating an order, and maybe taking a firefight later in the game from a weaker position, but really what it is is you will roll into turn two and turn three with a significantly larger order pool than many other armies. So transmutation is a big part of what makes Toha work, and it works in combination with the next piece of equipment we'll talk about, which is symbiomates and symbiobombs. Now, symbio bombs are the less important of the two. You will have sometimes one or two of these in an army. They will give a trooper a single-use offensive weapon called Ferroware. We'll get to that soon as well. Symbio mates are the big one. A symbio mate can be applied to any of your troopers with transmutation, and what it does is it triggers the first time the trooper is hit, effectively. You'll want to read the, few, the full rules for this, but it triggers the first time a trooper is hit, and it gives the trooper for the, the duration of that order in which they are hit, armor 9, BTS 9, and total immunity. So if you get hit by a full volley from a tag, four rounds hit you, the symbiomate kicks in, and you get armor 9, BTS 9, and total immunity for that attack, which will typically, not always, but typically save a trooper's life, even against quite a lot of firepower. You can still take wounds through symbio armor, even armor 9, total immunity in cover is not invulnerable but you are very likely to survive without damage and very, very likely to at least not die. This opens up uh, some plays that you can make in terms of attacking with Symbiomate Armored Troopers, but really what it does is it gives you a further layer of Crumple Zone on top of Transmutation that just compounds the fact that although Toha don't necessarily have outstanding gunfighters, engaging them takes a great deal of time. There are layers and layers that you have to strip away from Toha before you inflict meaningful damage on them. This makes their ARO game particularly good, it makes their offensive game failure tolerant, and it has to be failure tolerant because they aren't hitting really high watermark gunfighting, but those that resistance to one bad dice roll is extremely powerful. The last piece of equipment that Toha have access to that other factions don't at all is Ferroware. Ferroware is a ballistic skill attack weapon that functions primarily like a jammer. So it is a comms attack, technical weapon, no line of fire required, and it's active inside your zone of control in exactly the same way that a jammer does. What differentiates Ferroware from a jammer, and jammers are already very good pieces of equipment, is firstly, it isn't disposable, and secondly, Ferroware can do things that are very, very strong. The downside to Ferroware is that it does not work against models with structure if you're trying to use offensive Ferroware attacks. But what Ferroware can do, typically there are three different things, and you will see sometimes some or all of these in any given Toha list. They have an attack that is burst to, fires armor-piercing rounds, and just does wounds, which means that they are the only 
army that has a hacking-like effect that can literally damage opponents through walls. That's end game, and it is very strong. They have Eraser, which is effectively just a jammer. It isolates models. Obviously, unlike a jammer, it does not work on models with structure, but it is much more powerful in terms of its ammunition type. It is double action, and it is not disposable, which is very, very powerful. And then finally, they have a tactic called Mirrorball, which is probably the most important of the three. Mirrorball is the zone of control smoke targeted Eclipse Smoke Ferroware. So how Mirrorball works, this works in both active turn and reactive turn. It works exactly like a smoke grenade if a smoke grenade was being fired by a jammer. So you can nominate a point in your zone of control, which you do not need line of fire to, and make a whip roll, and on success you generate an Eclipse template in that position. This lets Toha do a couple of things. The first is, even if there is not necessarily an angle to throw an Eclipse Grenade, Toha can still block line of sight because they don't need line of sight to place mirror balls, provided they have a trooper with that skill in the area of operations. Secondly, mirror ball is surprisingly valuable as an ARO tool. Hypothetically, for example, if you imagine that like a heavy tag is pushing through your defenses, and because Toha have little to no hacking, you can't possess or immobilize it or anything like that, it is just pushing towards you, but it moves within zone of control of a model with mirror ball on its way to come around a corner. In as a zone of control ARO, in the same way that a jammer can be used as a zone of control ARO, you can use mirror ball to place an eclipse template anywhere in your zone of control, which means that as a preemptive defensive measure, you can just smoke out pieces that are going to be vulnerable to that tag when it rounds the corner or whatever that piece is. This lets you, now this is, this is a more niche application, but this lets you insulate yourself against assaults by pieces that you would otherwise consider yourself vulnerable to, things like Sujan, for example, by just covering your entire link team in completely impenetrable eclipse smoke and rendering them effectively invulnerable to anything but indirect attacks or close combat and engaging Toha in close combat may be harder than it seems. So unique pieces of equipment and weapons, symbiomate, symbiobombs, ferroware, transmutation, these are the mechanically unique equipment that Toha has access to. The fifth and final thing that Toha have that is relatively unique is that their fire team setup is quite different to other factions. It is closest to Steel Phalanx. Toha have an, an, an unlimited number of Haris teams. You may hear me refer to them as Triads, that's their old name. They can take as many three-person teams as they want, which hypothetically means they could field five, five Haris teams and a 15-trooper list. In addition, Almost any, or like the vast majority of Toha troops are linkable with no restrictions. You can, any any triad can be comprised of any three linkable troops in any combination, which allows for a very classic combination of specialist, melee smoke thrower, and gun to be duplicated over and over by Toha. Generally speaking, in any given list, I usually will have an average of about three triads. Two is on the light side, four is a lot, but you can also run up to four. But, but around three triads is typically, kind of ironically, the correct number. Different lists will use more or less depending on what they're trying to accomplish. This makes up for, to a degree, the fact that Toha have limited access. They have very limited access to the NCO skill and almost no access to the tactical awareness skill. That does not matter too much because as long as Toha are moving intelligently, one order will move multiple troopers around and fire teams, those, those three person fire teams typically are not pushing so much into the midfield or in vulnerable positions that their loss is crippling. It's not like moving a full five person heavy infantry corps across the table where it's destruction by counter assault from your opponent can lose you the game. Losing a three person Toha Harris team, not only do they typically go down pretty hard, like they go down fighting when they're attacked because of how they are comprised, but their loss is not the end of the game if they are destroyed at all. So the Toha three-person Harris teams give you quite a lot of options in terms of offensive and defensive strategy, pursuing scenario while also executing attacks. They are just generally efficient, and the burst bonus, both in active and reactive turn, helps you make up for the fact that otherwise, the entire faction basically tops out at about Ballistic Skill 13. So those are the mechanical and tactical things that really define Toha, at least to me, as a faction. Let's start looking at the most important profiles that they have access to and how they fit into a list. So here we just have an instance of Infinity Army open, and the first two troops we're going to look at are the ones that should be in almost every Toha list. Those are McCalls and Tacwheels. Yes, Toha names are a little bit confusing and repetitive. They have interesting syllable use, interesting vowel sounds, but bear with me, 
McCall troops. McCall troops are the linkable, impetuous, regular warband of Toha, and that is a very strong combination. There are other troopers like them in the game. Sometimes you can get even sort of like slightly stronger versions where you have irregular warbands that become regular when linked, but Toha have McCalls, and McCalls should be in almost every Toha army. They have very good close combat stats with a combination of CC23, Martial Arts 2, and the CC Attack minus 3 rule, which means that they impose an additional negative 3 penalty to whatever role your opponent is making in a face-to-face -face role when declaring CC Attack, and they have quite good uh, CC weapons, your choice basically of either Viral or DA. Those two 13-point profiles are the ones that you should typically be using. Your preference as to which. Personally, I lean towards double action, and the reason for that is in some scenarios, not that many in ITS 15, but in some scenarios, anti-material uh, anti is important. But just kind of more than that, what I have found over long experience is that armor is generally fairly consistent, whereas BTS can vary wildly. And trying to fight a BTS 6 or BTS 9 trooper, and those, those stats appear on the most random of troopers. You just have random, like, BTS 9 interventors, for example, BTS 6... Um, Hack Islam Mukhtars. Trying to punch those things out with viral CCWs is an exercise in frustration. It is just too easy for your opponent to turn a light, have a light infantry trooper that is as hard for you to kill as a tag. And so DA is just more consistent. It is more likely to give you basically broadly applicable results. The close combat is just part of what McCall offers, but they are very good at CC, able to quite evenly fight almost any CC troop in the game, except for the very strongest natural born warrior plus martial artist. And even then, thanks to CC attack minus three, it is a risk for those troops to engage McCalls. The weapon loadout though is what is really good here and the fact that they are linkable. So one McCall should appear in almost every fire team that you think might leave your deployment zone. You can have fire teams that sit in the DZ and are just fire support. You've just parked some linkable troops that you took anyway in there, maybe to multiply a sniper or a missile launcher, but any close, any fire team that is going to be leaving your deployment zone in any capacity should include a McCall. And the reason for that is that in addition to their CC stats, etc., and attractive cost, they are one of your main sources of Eclipse smoke. So they will give you Fizz 13 linkable Eclipse smoke grenades, which means typically they will be throwing Eclipse smoke templates either at long range, two dice on tens, which is quite reliable, or at short range, two dice on sixteens, which is very reliable. It doesn't end there though, they have heavy flamethrowers, which is very rare on this kind of linkable troop, and there is almost nothing in the game that will willingly walk into two heavy flamethrower templates without at least some risk, and they even have contenders. Now contenders in this case really just, they are an AO weapon first and foremost, you will rarely be making active attacks with them, but if for whatever reason your McCall is not responding with either Eclipse Smoke or a heavy flamethrower in AO, bear in mind that you do have surprisingly dangerous Ballistic Skill 11 burst two weapons out to 16 inches effectively, but which can fire beyond that. I really can't say enough good things about McCalls. You can even run certain link teams that are just two McCall troops and a trooper that does all of the other things that a fire team needs to. They are outstanding. McCalls should be in every Toha list. They should be in every Toha list in numbers. Two is usually the bare minimum, but you can take more than that. It is even possible to run them unlinked and impetuous them, because impetuous will get you three, three Eclipse smoke grenade throws, etc. They are totally serviceable in the warband role, but typically one McCall goes in every triad that will be moving. On the far other end of the expense spectrum in your average Toha list, we have Taquil officers. Taquil are medium infantry transmutation troopers, so we can see there an example of transmutation in action in Toha. So Taquil officers, they start at armor 3 BTS 6, but after they've taken a wound, they drop down to armor 3 armor 0 BTS 0, although they do gain the regeneration skill. Regeneration would obviously be useless uh, in the advanced form because they haven't taken any wounds at that point. They don't pick up regeneration until they become wounded. Important to note, you cannot regenerate that wound back. The transmutation change on this kind of trooper is irreversible, but at Fizz 10, it will sometimes recover the model from the unconscious state, forcing your opponent to spend those orders to kill them because these things coming back to life is just the worst feeling in the world for your opponent. Now, Taquiel officers fill two and a half significant roles in a Toha army. The half in this case is that they can gunfight. They are ballistic skill 13, and you can equip them with combi rifles, viral rifles, and spitfires. My personal preference is not to try and make them into gunfighters unless you absolutely have to. I much prefer them just to have combis and nanopulses to be cheap and make use of the other things that make them good, which is their ferroware tactics and leadership. 
So it is viable to have them be, so for example, you can have a chain of command, Tacwheel Spitfire, running around with just two McCalls, and that is a very self-sufficient fire team where it has access to Ferroware Tactics, a Whip 14 Specialist, a Burst 5, BS 13 gun, and two McCalls. But for preference, I prefer to play these guys down-gunned and making maximum use of their Ferroware with a more efficient or effective gunfighter rounding out the fire team. Generally speaking, that means that there are two profiles that I will take in any given game. For me, I will always run a tack wheel officer as my lieutenant, and I prefer the tack wheel lieutenant plus one order because I run this guy unlinked. Now, that is not compulsory. You can absolutely run these tack wheel officers linked, and if you intend to, for them to stay linked the entire game, you might pick the tack wheel lieutenant with plus one command token instead. You can also just pick the lieutenant with plus one order with the intention of breaking him out of the link when it's necessary to do so, reforming the link afterwards or not, as the case may be. But I really like a combat group two that includes a tack wheel combi rifle lieutenant plus one order because you can spend those orders incredibly flexibly. The tack wheel has two ferroware tactics and they are very, very good ones. Endgame, which is the tactic that does damage directly to models who have the wound attribute, and then Mirrorball, which lays Eclipse Smoke in zone of control without needing line of fire. The number of times it has been the tack wheel lieutenant spending two lieutenant orders to lay down two, one or two key smoke templates that have enabled an attack, and that will that just comes from the lieutenant orders, unlinked, coming out of combat group two, to enable combat group one to go and do something really significant. Ha happens all of the time when I'm playing Toha, and if that's not what the, the doctor ordered for a particular game or particular tactical situ situation, he can also just Rambo. So being a technical weapon, Ferroware tactics don't benefit from links, so you may as well put him by himself, and being able to be by himself runs forward and just you know spews out Ferroware tactics endgame, kills, I don't know, hypothetically an entire Steel Phalanx link, for example. And one of the luxuries that Toha have is that it is quite common to have at least one, but sometimes two or more chain of command models in a Toha list. We can see one there already, the chain of command tack wheel. If you want to have two tack wheels, you have to take the chain of command as the second one, but that gives you a very good chain of command model who is a Whip 14 specialist, who is then able to go and pick up the Lieutenant's burden if the first one dies by overextending. This won't be the only chain of command model that we'll see. A lot of my lists will have two. We'll get to that in a moment. But basically, tack wheel officers, the reason why they are the second most important in it, um, troop in any Toha list is that they are one of your best linked team members, your only source of endgame as a ferroware tactic, realistically, your only common source of mirror ball as a ferroware tactic, and excellent linkable specialists, unlinkable lieutenants, very, very good pieces. You should usually have one and often two tack wheels in a list, although they are expensive. The next three and a half profiles we'll be talking about are our bread and butter profiles. And those are Sukwails, Sakiels, and Kaeltar. And then we'll talk about Nikuls as well, because I like them very much. Sukwails and Sakiels, and yes, that is very confusing. They did chose to make those two things sound very similar. Those are your bread and butter, link team, do thing, gunfight, be specialist occasionally, just useful models. Sukwail commandos are the first of the two that we'll talk about, and they are the elite gunfighting symbio armor profile pieces. We can see Sukhail Commandos on screen now, and we can see that they they have Veteran, which is very nice. They don't lose that when they transmute. They start at BS-13, Armor-2, BTS-3, and importantly, Mimetism-3, and they go down to, they lose all of their armor, all of their BTS, and their Mimetism when they transmute. Nevertheless, this means that, usually they'll be given a Symbiomate, while they have that first wound intact, in a link team, they represent, for example, a Burst 5 BS-13 Mimetism-3 gun, which is not an absolute world beater, but it is very serviceable, and especially when combined with the fact that they'll have access to Clip Smoke on tap, etc., etc., they, they are able to go to places that they need to be and fight very, very effectively. They are very, very solo. They are your best in class gunfighters that can go into links. And while they're not the best in the world, they are very good and they are not too expensive. The heavy machine gun is only 34 points. And as a bonus, it is a veteran troop. It comes with D charges, making it quite good at doing classifieds. And at short range, it has a plus one burst breaker pistol, which means that it is firing at close range, burst four, BS-13, mimetism, breaker ammunition. Now, my three personal favorite Sukwell Commando models in approximate order are the HMG, for various obvious reasons, then the K1 Sniper Rifle, and then the K1 Combi. But all of them are basically good, although I would only occasionally take the Sukwell Lieutenant. The 
HMG does not really need an explanation. It's the best heavy machine gun that you have access to by a wide margin in Toha. But the next two, the K1 Sniper and then the Missile Launcher deserve a comparison. Both of these are your very long range linkable weapons that can threaten tags and serve as an ARO pace. And this is a question of personal preference. I know very good Toha players who much prefer the Sequoia missile because the high watermark, particularly in ARO, for what that missile launcher can do if your opponent rolls badly and you roll well is very high. And it's worth noting that by combining Symbiomates and Symbio Armor, you give yourself lots of chances to roll well and for your opponent to roll badly. So they prefer the missile launcher. I prefer the K1 sniper rifle for a couple of reasons. The biggest reason, frankly, is that it is five points cheaper. Toha are a faction running a lot of kind of middleweight to moderate expense pieces, nothing that is really, really expensive, but we've got lots of pieces that are 20 and 30 and 35 points. And so anywhere that you can save five points can represent really significant upgrades elsewhere in your list. The second reason is that a K1 weapon, K1 sniper rifle in particular, not only is it a serviceable ARO piece, in the sense that, yes, the maximum damage it can do is much less than a missile launcher, but it's still linkable, and you can give it a symbiomate and put it in a high place and force your opponent to deal with it in order to play, with the, play the game. But burst three K1 rounds from a very long way downtown can open up play against tags, because we've just talked about how much we like the Sukwell HMG, but one of the things that a damage 15 HMG does not want to do is spend seven orders fighting a tag, trying to do one or two wounds to it. The K1 sniper rifle forces things like Yotams to put their head down. Now, you won't want to fight an avatar or a cutter because mimetism, mimetism minus six is very hard to overcome. But anything else, any just 70 to 80 point, eight wound, sorry, eight armor, three wound main battle tag that your opponent is like putting on ARO to force you to throw more smoke than you'd like to, it fears a K1 sniper rifle. And because it fears a K1 sniper rifle, it's likely to hide. And because it's likely to hide, you can play more efficiently. Finally, we have the K1 Combi Rifle Sukwell Forward Observer. At a relatively affordable 32 points, it gives you your specialist, and that is a specialist with, uh, it's a veteran troop with D chargers and a Forward Observer, which is surprisingly good in the current uh, classified deck. It is your basic do everything pace. The only reason that I don't run, also randomly, it has a K1 Combi Rifle, and the K1 Combi Rifle is especially good at killing tags because you can use your smoke to deliver it inside 16 inches where you're engaging in optimal range and the tag will be at you know significant penalties. The only reason I don't take the Sukwell K1 Combi Forward Observer in many lists is that it kind of competes with space for that chain of command tack wheel, which costs a little a few more points, but is a whip 14 specialist rather than whip 13, and comes with all of the power and versatility that is Ferroware. Nevertheless, Sukwell commandos are very important. They are one of your bread and butter troops and they should be in many Toha lists. Slightly less common, but still important to mention, are your Sakiel Regiment troops. These are just line infantry, although again, they are the veteran troop type, which can be quite useful when doing classifieds. And what the Sakiel Regiment are is they are your Sukwell commandos at home. You should, generally speaking, try and find the points to say, take Sakiel Regiment troops over the inferior single wound Kameel Infantry Lion Troopers, but you can fill out regiments where you otherwise wouldn't be able to, or so regiments, fire teams where you otherwise wouldn't be able to afford a Sukwail with a Sakiel. There are a couple of profiles that are particularly relevant here. If you have lots of SWC spare, then a Spitfire is fine. It's quite good, and it's very cheap at 22 points. It's only going to be Ballistic Skill 12, but it still has two wounds. It only loses a couple of points of armor when it, when it transmutes. And Burst 5 BS-12 will do in a pinch. I also quite like the Viral Combi Rifle profile, which is 23 points, but comes with Fizz 11 EM grenades. And Viral rounds are very dangerous, especially at Burst 4. You can have like a, a Group 2, we couldn't afford anything else, but we have some pieces that can link link team with a Sakiel Regiment Viral Combi in it, and it will pose a credible threat using those groups. Group two orders. And then finally, the paramedic. Toha are a faction that can make really good use of paramedics. They're surprisingly high fizz, even when transmuted. So for example, we can see there that a Sakiel is fizz 11 when transmuted. McCalls that go unconscious are fizz 13. You can make 
surprisingly good use of linked paramedic shots to revive troopers, and it is a specialist that can go in links, and it has EM grenades, and it has two wounds. So the Sakiel paramedic, as again, at 19 points, is extremely affordable for a two wound model that you can add into linked teams, basically when you can't afford something stronger, but you don't want to add in a single wound trooper, because why would you do that when you can add a two wound trooper? Sakiels are very good, just don't confuse them with sukwils, despite the fact that they sound very similar. It's one of the distinctions you'll often have to make at the beginning of any game. Our next most important uh, unit is the Kaeltar Specialist. Now, despite the fact that they are called Kaeltar Specialists, uh, they are only occasionally actually specialist troops. There are four profiles there, and two to three of them will see regular play. The easiest to put in any list is 15 points for the light shotgun version, and we can see there in its equipment that it comes with a symbiobomb and a symbiomate. Now, it does not use those themselves. It allocates them out when it's deployed to troopers who have the transmutation rule. Those are models that are eligible to take symbiomates and symbiobombs. And symbiomates and symbiobombs, but especially symbiomates, are so useful that you should almost always, not in every situation, but in most lists, you should have two Kaeltar Specialists. They are also linked and have light shotguns, which means that you can use them as link filler in basically any situation. I mentioned that one of the reasons why you might take a Sukhoi or K1 Sniper is because you have other linkable troops that are sitting around in your DZ, so you may as well put them into a link to get a long-range shot or a long-range error option. Two Kaeltar Specialists is a very good example of what you might link that Sukhoi or K1 Sniper with. Ultimately, though, symbiomates especially are so useful to the Toha war effort that you always want to make sure that your army has two to three of them. So long as you have viable units to put them on, you want to think when you're doing list construction, how many troops in this list really want a symbiomate? Sukhoi commandos in particular are a prime candidate. So however many of those you have, you want to try and make sure you have a symbiomate for them. Symbiobombs are more nice to have. Um, they are single use, obviously single use ferroware tactic tools, tend to be much lower impact. Symbiomates are very important. So the light shotgun 15.1 is the one that I will most often take, but in some lists I will also spend considerably up in order to get the chain of command combi rifle 28 point model. Now chain of command itself is nice, that makes that model a bit 14 specialist, but the real reason why you take this profile is that it doesn't come with a symbiomate and symbiobomb, it comes with two symbiomates. Because these troopers are availability two, this is the only real way to get three or four, but typically three, symbiomates into a Toha list. If you want that third one and it can really make a difference, you have to pay significantly for it. But more chain of command does not hurt. It's a bit 14 specialist. So I will often, for example, run one Kaeltar light shotgun flash pulse symbiobomb symbiomate and one very expensive Kaeltar chain of command with two symbiomates. These are troops that should be in, in fact, basically these will be in as many lists as McCalls and Tacquils and Sukwales, uh, possibly more. You will almost always run at least one. Frankly, you will almost always run two. It's just a question of in what configuration. We have two more troops to mention at the very bottom end of the bread and butter section, and that the first of those is the Nikul Ambush Unit. Now, the Nikul is one of those pieces that is kind of uniquely Toha in that it is a sapper troop. Now, sapper is not in any way unique to Toha, but having a sapper troop like the Nikul Ambush Unit kind of is. So, on its base, it is a multispectral visor level 1, BS12, sapper with two wounds, and it loses very little for passing into the transmutation state, just some armor and BTS with a viral sniper rifle. At 27 points, that is extremely efficiently costed, and part of the reason for that is that a Nikul actually can't link. Unlike a lot of the other models in Toha, it is not eligible to join a Haris team, so it has to fight by itself. But in the Sapper state, it is an outstanding candidate for a Symbiomate, and a Nikul can stall out your opponent's advance more cost-effectively than many other things in the game. Because it has that MSV1, your opponent can't smoke past it, like they could, for example, past a Sukhoi K1 sniper rifle. They have to engage it. And the Sapper rule is very, very good on a piece like this, because it opens up deployment options that otherwise wouldn't exist. I had a game just recently where my opponent deployed the Nikul Ambush Unit literally on a table edge, because they can, out of cover, because it has Sapper, which gave it a diagonal line all the way across the table to really considerable effect. I had to absolutely bust my gut disengaging, like to, to push past the thing, 
I have to throw good money after bad to take it down. And that is what good placement using Snapper, Sapper will enable you to do. Nickel Ambush Unit for that reason is a premier defensive piece. It also, frankly, isn't a bad offensive piece in a pinch. Now, yes, it's only going to be burst two, but you can do things with a Nickel. You can put it in combat group two, where you will have sometimes some orders to spare. And although it's not hugely efficient, it can use those orders to maybe, say, crawl along the ground, then use a long skill to enter the Sapper state, which will change its silhouette, but not provoke ARO. So if you're prone out of line of sight, out of line of sight, and then you declare Sapper, your silhouette will change to three at the end of that order after any window for AROs. Then you can spend subsequent orders actually taking fights. Now for a nickel ambush unit to effectively take fights in active turn, it's only burst 12, it's only burst two. It has to maximize its use of range. Sniper Rifle can theoretically outrange any other weapon in the game, except for another Sniper Rifle, and that includes missile launchers. And I have had games where I have engaged enemy missile launchers at 40 and a half, 41, 42 inches. And when you flip the script in range on a missile launcher from plus three to minus three, a nickel, nickel ambush unit, particularly with MSV-1 and Mimetism, can suppress pieces like that. So attacks of opportunity, like if you see a line with a nickel ambush unit and you have you know, a couple of orders to spend, positioning it, putting it in sapper, and then shooting, it can be very worthwhile, but by no means sort of obligatory. Unlike pieces like the Sukwail, Sakwil, Takil, Makal, etc., a Nickel Ambush unit is getting into that territory of sometimes food. Uh, I like having them in lists, but they are not mandatory. They're just quite nice to have. And you can do things like, for example, cut them for, say, Sukwail sniper rifles, which are linkable and will get you similar performance, but be more valuable sometimes in active turn, etc. The last bread and butter piece that bears mentioning is the humble Chaxa Auxilla, in particular the Chaxa Auxilla FTO sensor baggage profile. Now you will not be linking this, despite the fact that it's an FTO. What this model is, is it's a 10 point regular order when you have nothing else to do with your with your 10 points and troop slots. But for 10 points, this thing far exceeds the humble Fusilier. Although it is armor zero, BTS zero, it has a plus one damage heavy flamethrower and a sensor and baggage. That's excellent, basically. Like, Toha do not want for corner guards because you have linked McCall's two or three of those in a list. But if you just, you know, if you need to fill a few more slots, if you just need a few more regular orders, Chaxa Auxiliaries are your go-to. On top of that, every now and again, the fact that they have sensors will be really, really relevant. 80% of games, it is not a skill that is particularly meaningful, but in 10, 20% of games, it can really matter. It enables you to do some classifieds you might other or a classified you might otherwise struggle with, but against all manner of camouflage esque things, you're playing against a JSA opponent who has just made two infiltration rolls, for example. The sensor skill can be very very useful. Mostly though, it is just a par excellence corner guard that generates a regular order. Now, the only reason why you might not take tons of Chaxa Auxilas in a list is because you ultimately have only so many troop slots, you'll have plenty of other models generating regular orders, and this is where we get to the irregular pieces that Toha have. Now, Toha are no hack Islam in terms of quality of irregular troops, and even though there is a plus one command token tack wheel, you still do need to limit yourself in terms of how many irregulars you can meaningfully take. But there are four very good irregular pieces in Toha, and you will typically want to take two or three of them, which we'll talk about now. So the first of four high quality irregulars that Toha have, ac Toha have access to, and the only one I would consider a genuine auto include in most lists, is the Toha Diplomatic Delegate, in particular the Specialist Operative Profile. This piece is very, very, very good for five points. So if we look at the profile, the first thing that we see is that it is a Specialist Operative, Whip 13, Irregular. Pan Oceania would pay five points for a Tech B who is Whip 12 and be happy with that purchase. Of course they would, they're Pan Oceania. Whip 12 is a miracle for them. The Delegate is Whip 13, which is passable, but that is just where they begin. In addition, they have a Nano Pulsar, which is a template weapon, and a Pistol, which is a BS weapon, and a Flash Pulse, and they have Ferroware Tactics Eraser. Now, Eraser is the fairway tactic that is like a jammer. It only hits models that have wounds, but it is double action, and it is unlimited, unlike a jammer, which is disposable, and it is burst to inactive, which means that a Toha diplomatic delegate can genuinely go loud and just do things like run into zone of control 
of a Masai Moran and isolate it to turn off the repeater. And yeah, she might get spotlight in the process, but she's a five point irregular. She costs less than most irregular warbands or less than many irregular warbands. She costs less than a Jamma Ghazi Matawia. And she's not with 15 like a Ghazi, but she is considerably superior. This piece should frankly be in just about every Toha list. Her fairway tactics give you a basis for defense. She has a nanopulsa, which makes her a serviceable corner guard. At five points, she is a foundational piece. You will see her in both Spiral Core and Toha armies. She is very, very good. I will typically put her in Combat Group 2. I have a Combat Group 2 setup that I like, and that is just to make sure that there is a specialist in Combat Group 2, because sometimes you just need to spend orders pressing buttons, and being able to do that with both Combat Groups rather than just one is important. So next, and needing no introduction, is the Libertos Freedom Fighter. As, just as with many vanilla factions, and Toha is a vanilla faction, you have access to Libertos, and Libertos are very, very good. Uh, I really don't need to explain how and why Libertos are wonderful, efficient, defensive, and offensive cheap skirmishers. Uh, they will go in many of my lists, and I love them very, very much. In Toha in particular, uh, you it usually should be possible to find the SWC for Libertos, because you can't really run a guided missile hacking package in Toha, which typically leaves you with SWC spare for guns. And it is a fairly lean SWC setup to have three one and a half SWC guns, a half an SWC chain of command Kaltar specialist, and then a one SWC Libertos. The main utility that a Libertos offers in Toha that it might not offer anywhere or as much anywhere else is that Toha deployment is a little bit restrictive. So I mentioned that uh, Kaltar specialists allocate their symbiomates and symbiobombs when they deploy. And what that means is that you can't reserve a model most of the time, we'll get to one exception, easily and have it have a mate or a bomb. You have to have those models all deploy kind of at the same time. That means that your reserve option in Toha is kind of up in the air. You, you know, you, you, most of your army will be committed before the reserve drop. And the Libertos makes an excellent reserve drop. Yes, it's mine layer, will be heavily telegraphed. That is what it is. It's still a Libertos, it's still good. And you can use it either to you know, pinch off attacks or to launch attacks. It's non-committal, it's strong, and it, it, because you're not reserve dropping anything else, you have the luxury of reserve dropping a Libertos, and reserve dropping Libertoses increases their effectiveness. Not more needs to be said. A Libertos will not go in every single list because we are starting to get into the competitive end, like the you know the, the genuine competition between irregulars here after the diplomatic delegate, but it will go in a lot of lists. So our next two are the Motorized Bounty Hunter and the Beast Hunter. And the Motorized Bounty Hunter, I will generally, generally, not always, but generally only take the Submachine Gun Chain Gun Profile, Chain, chain Cold Profile. The Beast Hunter you could take in either configuration, but my personal preference would be the 15-point Beast Hunter to kind of like fight alongside a Liberto. And if you don't reserve drop the Liberto, you reserve drop, say, for example, your Lieutenant Tack Wheel instead, that's a fine choice. Um, then you can deploy the Liberto and the Beast Hunter kind of close together and offer some confusion around what the mine is. Now, I will usually take of the two the motorized bounty hunter, but either is fine, both are good, this is a matter of what you like as a player, but generally speaking, Toha will really only be able to afford three irregulars at absolute most. In either case, the role of the motorized bounty hunter or the beast hunter is usually going to be a cheap irregular attack piece alongside the Liberto for when you don't want to YOLO a fire team forward. Your fire teams, you know, are still expensive. They are only moving at 4-4 speed the majority of the time. They typically don't forward deploy, etc. So having a piece that can just like yeet toward the opponent deployment zone and then do something effective, make some kills, pave the way, things like a motorized Bounty Hunter and a Beast Hunter are ideal for that. They are basically just disposable attack pieces, but Toha, as much as anyone, benefit from having some kind of a Warband-esque presence. Someone, Sometimes someone just has to eat it in order to open a breach or begin the attrition trade in your way. You will usually want to pick two of the three, Liberto, Motorized Bounty Hunter, and Beast Hunters, to fill that role. Sometimes one, if you've got other things going on, but you know, usually, usually one or two of these pieces alongside the Delegate as your Irregulars. So from here, that is that is the baseline of Toha list building. That is the bones of most Toha lists covered. 
From here, we are going to cover some of the weird and wonderful elements that I would direct people toward as worth experimenting with. But really, with the basis covered, you can go out and explore pretty much the rest of the faction kind of as you like. There are no pieces after those ones that I've already talked about that I would consider absolute staples in every list. But there are pieces that are very interesting and worth experimenting with those. And the first of those is Janstar Quitan Imposter. Now, there are there are three impersonation regiments in Toha, of which one you will never take because it is just a worse version of Janstar, that is the regular Quitan Imposter, but Janstar and Gryphops both deserve to be talked about as very interesting. There are some players who swear by Janstar, and that is not without reason. Now, personally for me, the play style for him, I consider him a sometimes food, but let's break down what it is and what he does and why he is good. So Janstar is an impersonator, only whip 13, but you don't need to roll to deploy on your opponent's deployment line or anywhere within their half of the table, with transmutation, which means that he has two wounds. There is no other impersonation model in the game that has two wounds, which means that Janstar is a model that can survive a chain rifle, it can survive a random combi hit, it can survive a mine, and continue on to make some kind of attack. In addition, the weapon loadout that Janstar has is very well suited for making that kind of attack, combining uh, a light shotgun, a plus one burst viral pistol, which can be used at range but can also be used in CC, and Jan's CC skills are just good enough to make that occasionally worthwhile. CC 20, CC attack minus three, plus one burst from the viral pistol means that he can be rolling two dice on 20s in melee, which against something like a Fusilier might be worth considering over, say, just a light shotgun template only has impersonation 2, which means that he deploys in the weak impersonation state, which makes him very easy to discover in your opponent's active turn, but it still gives him all of the deployment benefits. The last piece of equipment that's worth noting is that he has shock mines, which can set up certain interesting forks if you have the orders to do so. You can break impersonation if you are impersonated to begin with, lay a shock mine, and then present a fork. And one of the interesting forks that you can present here is Janstar has transmutation, which means he can be allocated symbiomates and symbiobombs. Now we need to break down how that works because there is typically a way to do it. The first rule is, you can't give mates and bombs to models in a marker state, so Janstar has to give up the impersonation state when he deploys. That is fine, that is entirely optional. You can still deploy using the impersonation skill without being in the impersonation state, and you can then have a Kaeltar specialist allocate a symbiomate and a symbiobomb to you. Now, generally, Janstar wants to be your reserve drop, which means you have to spend a precious command token to also reserve the Kaeltar specialist so that it deploys at the same time as Janstar and can actually allocate the mate and the bomb to Jan. But provided you do that, you can deploy Janstar as your reserve with the symbiomate and a symbiobomb, not in impersonation state, but kitted out to the gills. And a symbiomate on a model like Janstar is very powerful. And a symbiobomb combines with things like his light shotgun and shock mines to present an interesting fork. So say you're playing against a light infantry link and you don't want to just round the corner and shotgun them all to death, you want to do something more technical, you can move up, lay a mine, and then move and threaten the symbiomate, symbiobomb rather. And so a razor or end game are opposed by a reset and the mine is opposed by a dodge, which means it is impossible for your opponent's link to, to basically to avoid one of those two effects. And if they reset, you may just shoot the damn things. And if they if they dodge, then you can hack them, you'll hack them, quote unquote, use Ferroware to say, isolate the link leader or wound the link leader, which can break up the link and then you know make effective plays. Now, Janstar is an absolute playmaker, and you would think from the way that I've just described him that he would go in every single list. I find that he doesn't. I think he is a sometimes food, and there are a few reasons for that. The first is he only deploys in impersonation two state, which means he's very, very easy to discover, and you don't always go first. And if you don't go first, and you've dedicated this entire setup, if minimum 31 points in one SWC, he can be a piece that it is trivially easy for your opponent to find dig out, kill, and then get up in value. They've just killed 10% of your army if they kill Janstar. And unlike a Hassassin for day, he is one, considerably more expensive, and two, uh, there's no chance that your opponent wastes multiple discover rolls because you, you'll often be discovering on 16s or even 19s against Janstar. It's just very easy to discover him. So that 
risk in particular, I think, is the main reason why I don't lean toward Janstar in lots of my lists, because he really is, like, he is a go first or hide in a corner kind of pace. It isn't the end of the world if he hides in a corner, maybe does something later in the game, you know, draws your opponent away, something like that. But the high watermark for what he can accomplish is considerably lower if he deploys and you are going second. Nevertheless, he's a very interesting piece, and often he's one of those pieces that exemplify Toha, where the first and even second time an opponent plays against Janstar, and they don't recognize what it means when you as a Toha player are going first and have spent a command token to reserve two models, it can just lead to absolute blowout games that are very, very interesting, but will typically, as your opponents play against pieces like Janstar, they will learn to play against him. Now, because of the fact that he has two wounds that can be given a symbiote mate, etc., he is not as susceptible to being countered by things like a reserve drop Libertos, but it is still very possible to slow him down and counter him with things like a reserve drop Libertos or Mind Layer. He is less susceptible and can break through blockades like that in the way that, say, like a, a, a Fide or a Speculo wouldn't be as able to, but he's not invulnerable to that kind of to that kind of counter. He's just he's just more durable to it. Next on the list of interesting pieces is Toha's second impersonation state model, and that is the Grife Operator, in particular the 21-point Grife Operator. Now, it does cost one SWC, but at 21 points, the Grife is the cheapest impersonator in the entire game, and that alone makes it deserve consideration. Uh, it also has an MSV1 and decharges, which means that it can accomplish some surprising things in terms of classifieds, and if, for example, you are playing Resilience Operations, the Grife Operator can sometimes score you three points in the first order order of the game. But mostly what the Drive Operator does is at a at a considerably cheaper cost than Jan Star, it presents threat. Every impersonator represents a danger to your opponent they have to respond to, and spending orders, maybe climbing up into a building to discover and kill a Grife Operator that can take wind out of your opponent's sails, is a, is a much more acceptable loss to stall out their first turn than losing a piece as expensive as Jan Star. In addition, a Grife Operator at only 21 points is something that you're much more willing to just roll the whip roll to attempt to infiltrate into your opponent's deployment zone with. And once you're doing that, you start opening up things like kills on missile bots and hackers, because a BS-11, MSV-1, surprise attack, combi rifle, slash breaker pistol, plus one burst, is very capable of just doing damage to one piece that your opponent really didn't want to live without. I've talked in the past about how nomads are a very, very powerful faction, but they are one of the most susceptible factions in the game to being unpicked by losing just one key piece in any given list, Grife Operators are a tool that can do that much more cheaply than Jan Star, which means the, list, the rest of your list does not have to compromise as much by comparison. Much like Jan Star, a Grife Operator is by no means an every list piece. It is a sometimes food, but it's a very fun piece to experiment with, something to be aware of if you're playing against Toha, and something to think about if you're playing with Toha. Now, the last category of this is interesting and you should consider it profiles in Toha are the peripheral Toha, to per peripheral Toha pieces. This is a little bit of a sub-theme, and there are a few pieces in Toha that just have peripherals that are really, really good compared to peripheral pieces in other factions. Now, they aren't, as a total profile, necessarily that efficient or that strong, but they can be quite fun to experiment with and form the basis of either a list archetype or an element in a list that is kind of cool. And so the two main ones of these are the Rasail and the Kerail, although we will talk about the Gorgos, because even if the Gorgos is unspectacular, its Chaxa peripheral does deserve mentioning. So the first of these three is the Rasail boarding team, and there are a few things to look at in terms of the Rasail, but the first one is the fact that the Rasail in its non-transmuted in its battle, its main battle state, has two wounds. It then transmute down to inactive, which means that in total, the Rassal boarding team is the only non-tag model in the game that has a full three wounds. It's not no wounding cap, etc. This thing will pass into unconscious. It's Fizz 11. It can be paramedic. You have to deal three wounds to a Rassal before it is unconscious and four wounds before it is dead. Now, that's pretty cool, uh, and the Rassail is relatively affordable. It doesn't have any skills like Frenzy that discount it, so it isn't in the same ballpark as, for example, Sakiel Regiments, which have Impetuous, or McCalls, which, sorry, which have Frenzy, or McCalls, which have Impetuous, but it is not unreasonably costed. Um, we're looking at, for example, the Light Shotgun Contender profile, which includes the Chaxa Peripheral, which is another wound, by the way, which means we're talking at four wounds worth of model for just 32 points, which is a very good 
good ratio. Uh, that's quite reasonable. You have a variety of weapons here. None of them are specialists. All of them come with nano screens. I personally prefer either the uh, non-lieutenant 35 point viral combi rifle, very occasionally the 36 point, I don't know why it costs extra, viral combi lieutenant, or the light shotgun contender. The combi rifle shock mines is fine, the boarding shotgun 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 shock mines is fine, but really for me it's the viral combi, which is very dangerous, or the light shotgun contender, which is a surprisingly cheap weapon loadout that gives you a variety of range bands, decent damage, and a template weapon on a three wound model, and then of course all of them come with Chaxa peripherals. And Chaxa peripherals slap. These things cost four points, and I want you to just look at that profile and compare it to an Oxbot. It's Silhouette 2 rather than Silhouette 1, which is an advantage. It is 6.4, it's the same speed. It's a heavy flamethrower, same as an Oxbot. But in addition, it has Mimetism minus 3, which is colossal, and it has a Ballistic Skill 11 pistol, which doesn't sound like much, but if you're up against an opponent who is like a high dodge piece and they elect to dodge against your heavy flamethrower, you have a BS-11 pistol that you're probably in good range against them out of cover to fall back on, which means that Rassal boarding teams can fire four, five, or six dice in active turn. Yes, two of those dice will be pistol shots, but that's a lot of weight of fire. Now, generally, the use case for a Rassal is, is kind of the class fantasy for peripheral teams, right? You don't necessarily send the Chaxa in alone. In fact, against them in like a minefield, I would usually use the Rassail first to cop, like, you know, clear out any mines, take it on the symbiote armor. And then you want to launch a coordinated assault. You want to come around a corner at the same time and present your opponent with a heavy flamethrower slash, slash pistol and a light shotgun contender or viral combi or whatever loadout it is you have. And you want to fire all of those into you know, whatever your opponent is is that you are, you are going after. That is a lot of damage that this piece can potentially do, and it presents that wonderful ARO fork where in the same action you are firing a template and a whole bunch of ballistic skill attacks. Now, ultimately, Rassal boarding teams, to the extent that they fall by the wayside, it is just because even though offensively they are kind of a link team in a can by themselves, they don't have smoke and they aren't a specialist, which means that they are limited basically to offensive and defensive operations only. But if you've built the rest of your list and you have some points spare and you want to try something interesting, Rassal boarding teams can be a really fun and interesting piece. One of my most interesting and memorable experiences is I moved one of these things forward and I did a bunch of damage and then my opponent had attempted to spotlight and missile it. And it took, I, I had so many wounds on the Rassail that I was able to reset clear of the missile strike the first time. Yes, I took a wound, that was fine. Then they had to do it again. And it took an entire turn for a Nomad player just making spotlight attacks with Jasmine Jazz, took an entire turn to heavily wound but not kill. I think they rendered the Rassail boarding team unconscious and I recovered it with a paramedic the next turn. So Rassail boarding teams have a special place in my heart. They are absolutely just a fun piece to experiment with, but they can form a very interesting hybrid offensive defensive fighting piece they just can't do missions that well in a very similar place we have the Keral preceptors uh, these were a piece that in n3 i took two of in every single list but that's because they were much cheaper at that point they aren't anymore the past is past they are still quite good and interesting now this unlike the rassel the rassel which is 4-4 but has its 6-4 peripheral the Keral preceptor motors it is 6-4 in its untransmuted state it has super jump and it can be accompanied by typically anything one or two Surda Symbio Beasts. So the 24 or 32 point loadouts are my generally preferred ones. And Surda Symbio Beasts are just kind of melee bastards. For eight points, they are one of the best melee peripherals in the game. They really only compete with um, Uber Fall Commando Pupniks. And frankly, Uber Fall Commando Pupniks are better because they're one point. What a Surda Symbio Beast has is it has kind of like everything you want from a close assault slash defensive element on a peripheral that doesn't use a combat group slot. So a Surda Symbio Beast has a Pulsar, which is a BS weapon, template, large, and it's CC22 with a viral CCW that is Fizz 15 and has CC attack minus three. So in CC, it's not going to accomplish the same as like a, you know, a good martial artist would, but you can have two of these things jumping into melee at the same time and they are dogged peripherals, which means that they can just keep going and going and fighting. They also dodge on 18s. They dodge four inches on 18s. And they have 
dogged, as mentioned, which means that defensively, Soda Symbio Beast can be an absolute bastard to deal with. I have, again, had many games where a single Soda Symbio Beast has been basically standing in the path of a Link team, and the Link team does not want to move into range of the Pulsar, so they're forced to engage it, often with something like a combi rifle or maybe a HMG at close range because of how it's positioned, and it just sits there dodging on 18s until eventually it goes dogged, and then it just keeps dodging until they close in and just give up the ghost and they, they pulsar, get pulsar, etc. Sergio Symbio Beasts are a piece that is kind of like a Libertos in that it can just randomly outperform in games. And a piece that isn't even an irregular, but it's a peripheral which doesn't use up combat group slots is very, very good. Now, the closest thing to a downside of Karel Preceptors is that sort of like, you know, much like the Rassail, it isn't a specialist. It also isn't even really particularly a gunfighter. Your average Karel Preceptor has a BS-11 submachine gun and Fizz-11 smoke grenades. You do not want to be using those smoke grenades. There is old wisdom that you would combine the only source of non-eclipse smoke with MSV and Toha, and that was a way that they would do certain things in the game. No more. Don't use those smoke grenades unless you absolutely have to. You want to use your other pieces, your much better pieces, to throw much more reliable Eclipse. We're not here for Fizz, Fizz 11 smoke. The reason why you take the Karel Preceptor is that it is accompanied by multiple multiple Soda Symbio Beasts, and it is at least a 6-4 Super Jump Transmutation piece, which means that it's not easy to kill. Because of how much base size the symbio Soda Symbio Beasts take up, so two of them is two Silhouette 3 models that have to be in orbit of the Kerail. Usually I will only take one Kerail Preceptor in a list and it will have one or two Symbio Beasts, and I will use them first as defensive pieces. So I will use them as they will be roadblocks, picket elements, where my opponent has to fight those mutants to progress into my deployment zone. But that's that's excellent, right? That's still a really good use of the model. And then depending on the game state, they can also attack. Mutans are an exceptional piece for doing things like going after Masai Morans because they dodge crazy koalas on 18s. You don't care if they get spotlit. Frankly, if your opponent spends a turn missile launching Soda Symbio Beast while you are dodging on 15s and are dogged, that's a really good turn for you. So going after Masai Morans is really like one of the wheelhouses of Kerel Preceptors and their beasts. Just generally fun pieces, generally good pieces, highly mobile, like very highly mobile, 6 forward super jump. It's just managing in particular the, the silhouette 3 size of the Surtas that has a learning curve. Now the last and definitely most maligned piece in the profile, uh, the Pre so not preceptor, the peripheral interesting profiles you might like to consider is the Gorgos. Now personally, I do not think the Gorgos is particularly good. I think it is not a very strong tag. I think it does things that you don't particularly want Toha to do. And it actually suffers very, very slightly from being a transmutation profile. So every other tag can dismount the pilot in order to accomplish an objective. Now the Toha pilot absolutely is a specialist operative, but it is just part of the Gorgos. It is wearing the Gorgos as symbio armor, which means that it is transmuted, which means that the Gorgos has to lose three wounds before the pilot can be a specialist, which means for practical purposes, the Gorgos is not a specialist, unlike every other tag in the entire game. Now, regardless, there are some fun and interesting things around the Gorgos, and they really start with that little Chaxa peripheral. It's the same stat line as the Chaxas that we've been dealing with before, but unlike the flamethrower Chaxa on the Rassail, you get to choose here between either a light shotgun or a pulsar and EM grenades. And that is really funny. Having this tag accompanied by like just a little batshit genius bastard who's packing. Light shotguns can fire quite effectively out to 16 inches if they need to. Frankly, pistols can as well, but you know, we are what we are. And having who has EM grenades for close assault, the burst two light shotgun for close assault, the, sh the shotgun in good range. Like this is seven points for that Chaxa or four points for the cheaper version of that Chaxa is really cool. And if I could just take those peripherals on any model that wasn't the 71, 74 point Gorgos, I absolutely would because they are really, really cool. Unfortunately, they're stapled to a big dumb idiot and the Gorgos is just not super efficient. As mentioned, it can't be a specialist. It's just an AP Spitfire. It's very expensive. Like the, the 74 point Gorgos, 71 point Gorgos, that is the same kind of price bracket as a full HRMC tag. That's the same price bracket as a Salamander or a Dragao. And as cool as the Chaxa peripheral is, 
a BS14 AP Spitfire is not quite cutting the mustard in terms of what things need to be done. In addition, the Gorgos is a piece that is very hackable, even at BTS9, and attacking with a hackable piece is just Toha have enough issues punching through repeaters, etc., that dealing with a hackable piece is just a pain, a pain in the ass. Nevertheless, Gorgos are fun to play with, and there is a very small niche where they actually do one thing that's very, very cool, and that is in missions where you are looking to get points in zones or points in rooms, the fact that the inactive symbiote armor is just part of the tags profile means that although you may be in, act in, in inactive symbiote armor state, what you have there is a BS-13 specialist operative tack aware AP Spitfire single wound trooper worth 70 something points and or 67 points. And that's that's a very expensive single wound trooper, but it can get into an armory, for example. Uh, it can it can have taken those three wounds and still be points alive, still be points in zones, etc. I don't think that makes the Gorgos appealing enough to take as as a piece in regular Toha lists. But if you wanted to use one, they are on the list of things that are fun and interesting. Now, of course, that is by no means the ends of the Toha faction. There are many other pieces that we haven't discussed. We haven't discussed Galrails, we haven't discussed Gal Galtasos, we haven't discussed Nima Sitar, we haven't discussed Samsa, we haven't discussed Dral or Clipsos. These are all pieces that I might put in a list on any given day at any given time. But what we've covered, I think, are the real core of the Toha faction, what and how and why they play, and then what is the baseline for Toha list construction, and what are some interesting flourishes that I might direct players to first on their journey. At an hour of content, I think that's more than enough talking about Toha for one video, so I will leave it at that, but I'm happy to answer questions in the comments if you have any. As always, I hope you enjoyed this. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so either via the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description or by becoming a channel member. Big thanks to those people who have already. It does really mean a lot and it supports the channel moving forward. As always, I hope you enjoyed this. If you'd like to let me know what faction you'd like to hear about next time, I'm happy to take requests if this was an interesting video or an interesting listen, and I will see you next time.